All right, uh, let's get started. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you're located. <laughs> Uh, welcome to this public lecture hosted by uh, University of Nottingham, Ningbo, China. Uh, my name is Lei Li. Uh, I'm an associate professor of international business at Nottingham University Business School, China. Uh, I have uh, recently joined the newly uh, established Academy of International Business Asia Pacific chapter and have started to serve as uh, the country director for uh, mainland China. So uh, today is my uh, pleasure and honor to uh, invite uh, Professor uh, Frederick Contractor uh, to give a speech on a very timely topic, uh, that is the ascendancy of China, and then the relationship between China and the U.S., or the tension between China and U.S., and also uh, the future implications. Uh, as uh, some of you know, uh, Professor Contractor is a, a renowned international business scholar, uh, he is also currently uh, the president-elect of Academy of International Business. And uh, uh, Professor Kentrack will be introduced a little bit more uh, just in a minute. We will be introduced a little bit more uh, just in a minute. Uh, in addition to the speaker, uh, we also have uh, a panel. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm very glad uh, Professor Martin Lockett, uh, Dean of Nottingham University Business, Business School, China, uh, Islam panel. Uh, he will introduce Professor Contractor just uh, in a minute, and he will also participate in the discussion after the speech. Uh, I'm also uh, very delighted uh, to have uh, Professor Chang Chi Wu to be on the panel. Many of you know uh, Professor uh, Chang Chi Wu um, as a distinguished professor uh, at Guanghua School of Management, Peking University. Uh, he was also uh, the chair of, of AIB China chapter for many years. Uh, you know, in addition to uh, his uh, position at Peking University, he's now also the dean and the chair professor of Shandong University School of Management. Uh, so, uh, Professor uh, Chang Chi Wu, can you wave your hand and for a moment? All right. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Yeah. And, uh, and I want to express my uh, particular uh, appreciation uh, to Mr. Andy Purdy, uh, who is uh, the Chief uh, Security Officer of Huawei uh, Technologies USA. Uh, Andy and I uh, happened to be in uh, a, you know, a forum uh, several weeks ago, and Andy shared a lot of uh, really and uh, insights uh, about uh, in the context of the U.S.-China relationship and also today's, uh, you know, global business world. Uh, so welcome, Andy. Can you please wave your hand for a moment? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and, and I'm also on the panel, uh, uh, you know, uh, but more importantly, I'm the moderator uh, of today's event. Okay. So without further ado, let me turn. Okay. So without further ado, let me turn over to uh, Dean Martin Lockett to introduce our speaker, Professor Contractor. Thanks very much indeed, Lei. Uh, I mean, it's great uh, to be here in China at the University of Nottingham Ningbo uh, and uh, to be, in a way, have a, one of the first events of the newly reformed Asia Pacific chapter, uh, the China Group. So delighted that, and I'm particularly delighted to be able to, to welcome Farah Contractor. Um, he's a distinguished professor of management and global business. Now that's both his title and it's the reality. He is very distinguished. Uh, he's based at Rutgers Business School. He's a fellow of the Academy of International Business, which is just a, a representation of the uh, depth of his work that includes 10 books, 150 articles. Um, he's got uh, a combination of uh, business and engineering degrees uh, from different countries, different universities. Uh, so from Wharton School, from Michigan, and from Bombay. Uh, and uh, what, what his research has focused on is some of the key issues in international business. And today, one of those key issues is the move away from what looked like an inexorable trend towards globalization. And uh, now it appears much more fragmented, much more mixed. So I'm really delighted that he's able to talk to us today, uh, talking about 
China has a strange relationship between the US and China, and then looking at continued future cooperation. Because many people uh, have argued this is actually will be more productive to everybody to have continued cooperation, even in a new international context. So I'd like to hand over to him uh, to give his talk and it'll be then followed by a panel discussion. So uh, Professor Contractor, maybe hand over to you. Thank you. Oh, and thank you for hosting this. So let me begin immediately by looking at uh, my third slide. I hope I, the change of slides comes through fairly quickly, I hope. Uh, anyway, there are enormous uh, complementarities and synergies between the US and China. Uh, after all, they just these two countries comprise 40% of the world GDP and 23% of the human population. And there is really no fundamental reason why the two economies should not cooperate on a broad range of issues, ranging from trade, FDI, healthcare. I mean, the emerging global issues are healthcare, green energy, electric vehicles, etc., for mutual benefit. Unfortunately, there's been an artificial, I emphasize that word artificial state of tension uh, in terms of anti-globalization reaction to the U.S. for uh, reasons we'll discuss later. And in China, I think a rather exaggerated sense of nationalism and people harking back 178 years to grievances that really have no relevance in the present day. Uh, there remain a vast majority of areas, sectors, and subjects on which the two biggest economies can cooperate. Um, let me just say that I have been visiting China probably at least two dozen times because we, Rutgers University, used to have an executive MBA program in Beijing and Shanghai. And also I visited once or twice as a tourist. And over the years, it's just been a thrill for me to see uh, the country transformed from people with blue colored garments riding bicycles and an occasional black colored vehicle to where now there are rather distressing traffic jams and uh, uh, people wearing blue jeans and so on. So I guess what I'm saying is uh, when a country progresses, when it grows more affluent, this is something we can all rejoice in uh, because it's part of uh, humanity. Unfortunately, under the last four years, we've seen this kind of uh, tit for tat. Uh, this is just a cartoon from The Economist magazine. And tariffs really, for the most part, amount to shooting oneself in the foot. That's the uh, message over here. Um, let's see what happened in the, as a result of the Trump tariffs. The U.S. deficit sh with China shrank somewhat in 2019. But you can see from this graph that the U.S. trade deficit with the rest of the world became even worse. And in terms of jobs in the USA, uh, here is the rather dismal to mediocre outcome, which is that in, in import competing sectors, U.S. jobs did increase by a mere 0.3%. But manufacturing overall, ma jobs in manufacturing overall fell by 1.1% because of the higher cost of imported uh, goods, imported components, et cetera, because of the tariffs. And by about 0.7% because of retaliatory tariffs imposed by China. So the overall effect of all of this was, I, you know, we all know that as students of international business was going to happen the overall effect on jobs was somewhat negative. What I'm going to cover today is a discussion of what's at stake in the relationship between these two biggest countries in terms of both trade, FDI. Then I, we can ask how dependent is the US consumer on Chinese products? Uh, because politicians in the United States, they claim falsely that wherever you go, uh, things are made in China, and that is displacing American production. Well, actually, it turns out that Chinese-made products are only a small fraction of what the American consumer spends uh, each household. And in terms of bringing jobs back to the United States, is that feasible? What is the role of global manufacturing? In general, 
uh, people have said in the United States, both politicians and pundits, that there's something wrong with American manufacturing and it's in decline. Well, actually the opposite is true, which I will show figures on. Uh, then there's the accusation that the RMB or the Yuan or the CNY, whatever you want to call it, is undervalued. And that's an accusation not just by Donald Trump, but goes all the way back to uh, I think Ronald Reagan who made the first uh, such accusation. We can very briefly in one or two slides talk about dollar surplus recycling, uh, security concerns and cyber espionage, and accusations of dumping. And finally concluding by saying what are the mutual benefits that are at risk. Let me go to the next slide. Um, on my screen, a part of my slide is cut off, but I hope you can see it in its entirety. Is that correct? Okay. So this is um, the last complete year's figures. Of course, we all know that starting in January 2020, things all around the world went downhill. But let's look at the picture for the first complete year, which is 2019. The U.S. exported only 180 billion to China, but imported 477, which would create an enormous deficit if it was goods alone of 345 billion, ameliorated somewhat or compensated somewhat by the fact that in services, the US is preeminently the world's biggest exporter. So there's a surplus in services to make the overall deficit 297 billion. Anyway, on the face of it, superficially, what scares some politicians in the United States is it seems that almost one third of a trillion dollars flows out of the US each year, every year that this is happening. And this has been happening, this kind of deficit, for at least 35 years. But of course, that's a misleading statement or partially or mostly misleading statement because much of that money comes back to the United States. We've seen these kinds of tensions where the Trump administration said, uh, China is raping our country. It's the te greatest theft in the history of the world. Uh, imposition of tariffs, allegations of dumping, subsidies, overcapacity, currency manipulation, cyber espionage, etc. But um, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. I hope it's a rebound to a more normal kind of relationship, especially under the new incoming administration under Biden, who actually said this. I, I took a quote from his speech, uh, on, you can see it on, on YouTube. We can do all we need, meaning the US can do whatever it wants without punishing anybody. So let's hope it sets the tone for a more positive cooperative relationship. So the next two slides, I'm going to uh, just examine why has the US trade with China been so unbalanced? So on the China side, of course, we have low wages. The all China average, if you include interior villages and mountains and so on, it's $1.80. But we know that on the east coast of China, where most of the manufacturing takes place, it's 5 to $6 an hour which is still very low compared to the US average labor rate, which is $37 per hour. In China, we have a so far abundant and docile or disciplined labor force, allegedly undervalued RMB. So these are the explanations for why China has a surplus against the US in terms of trade. Uh, frugality and a high savings rate, well, yes, uh, that's true, although I'm reading reports that the younger generation in China is actually rather free spending these days. Cozy relationship with banks result in lower interest rates for Chinese companies and uh, very clever, disciplined, educated Chinese can learn and absorb Western technology aided by government support. And finally, there's one more factor, which I show on this slide, which is the enormous uh, efficiencies in international transportation. In our recent big ships, which are 400 meters long, which can carry something like uh, 
7,540 foot equivalent containers. If you hypothetically put only t-shirts in a big <laughs> ship like that, you, one ship could carry 525 million t-shirts. And if so, given a crew of only 13 personnel and fuel, uh, the average cost per t-shirt is a mere three cents. So you can see how economies and transportation costs have accelerated global trade and globalization in general. On the US side, we're talking about why China runs a trade surplus against the United States. In the US side, it's arguably the highest or one of the highest after tax disposable incomes in the world, a very competitive and open US market where companies from all over the world, including American firms, compete for the US consumer dollar. Americans are not particularly brand loyal and are open to the idea of buying imported items. Sellers are forced to compete on price, which means that throwaway prices induce a throwaway society. I live in an affluent New Jersey suburb, and every now and then I'll see somebody has put on the sidewalk a perfectly functioning device or TV set or appliance. They've just put it there because they're bored with it and they want to buy a new one. Consumption is king. We have uh, currently at least lower negative savings rates and hence excessive excess uh, consumption. Let me now go to my calculation, which I began three years ago. This is an update and you'll find the 2017 calculation and the description in my blog, which is globalbusiness.blog. Anyway, uh, here are the, here's the data for trade. This is only China-US trade, not FDI. I'll talk about FDI or foreign direct investment a little later. So looking at these trade numbers, imports from China to the US. I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. Imports, um, you, we have a trade deficit of 477. And what LDAX is talking about is the World Bank's estimate of the share of labor in production for export. Um, so if I multiply 477 by 0.26, I get the labor content of China's exports to the US of about 124 billion. Then uh, from the Economist magazine, I have the annual wage in manufacturing in China. $7,920 per year. And therefore, uh, we get an estimate of the number of workers uh, at 15.65 million Chinese workers devoted to exporting to the US market. That's the estimate we get. Now, in terms of the number of Americans who work for companies that export to China, we multiply the 180 billion total American exports to China with the 0.47 World Bank LVAX factor, which is the labor content. And that gives us a labor content in dollars billion of 84.6. And in terms of the estimated wages for companies, uh, the estimates are really all over the map from 44,000 to 81,000. I've taken the average which is 61,200. And that gives us the figure of 1.38 million Americans uh, who work for exporting to China. And so this is from the World Bank. And just as an incidental throwaway comment, you can see that the labor content in US production has been steadily declining. I'll say more about that a little later, although it still remains fairly high in terms of exports at 0.47. In China, it's been around 0.26. So anyway, um, the conclusions for trade only, the conclusion so far, is that China has far more jobs at stake, 15.65 million, than the US, which is only 1.38 million in terms of the China-US trade, how many jobs are involved and, and presumably at stake or at risk. But putting it into context, of course, 
China's workforce as a whole is 776 million compared to the US total workforce of only 142 million. So percentage wise, we're talking about something like 2% of Chinese uh, workers uh, uh, and less than 1% for the US. Anyway, the broad conclusion is that China has far more jobs dedicated to the US export market than vice versa. Let's go to FDI. FDI stands for foreign direct investment, where multinational companies have come to Ningbo or Beijing or Chongqing or whatever and established subsidiaries. European or American multinationals is what I'm talking about. Well, here I'm talking about US multinationals. So uh, in terms of US FDI in China, we're looking at 269 billion invested capital with about 7,000 affiliates or subsidiaries. These are, I, I'm surprised that these are uh, rather soft estimates. We don't have an exact figure as yet. Anyway, um, the number of jobs, the number of jobs uh, in China who are working for US multinationals is between 1.4 and 1.6 million. By contrast, Chinese FDI in the US is much smaller, only 1,500 uh, affiliates or subsidiaries. And the estimate of jobs here is again an amazing variation in estimates. Um, one estimate from the National Commission on US-China Relations, which is an American uh, sort of uh, body task force, is 80,000. But according to China Daily, your newspaper, or your government's newspaper, is 140,000 jobs. So what we're talking about, oh, by the way, the, this column down here is again giving you the context. The broad context is that the total workforce in the US is 142 million, whereas in China, the total workforce is 776 million. So anyway, putting the two together, now I'm putting the numbers for trade and FDI together, what we're seeing is the maximum number of Chinese jobs at stake is in terms of exporting to the US 15.65 million, in terms of FDI working for American FDI affiliates 1.4 to 1.6. So the total jobs at stake in China somewhere like a little north of 17, point, uh, 17 million. And the maximum number of jobs at stake as far as American jobs are concerned is uh, between 1.4 and 1.52 million. And so, as I said, if you need to read more about my calculations or methodology, these are revised up to 2019. If you want to see my March 2017 article, which follows the same approach, you can go to H HTTPS, uh, et cetera, et cetera, globalbusiness.blog. That is my blog. And this has also been published in Rutgers Business Review. Um, the next slide, I get data from Deloitte in terms of the revenues of US multinationals in China and the revenue of Chinese multinationals in the US. It's a four to one ratio. Uh, American multinationals in China have an estimated revenue. Deloitte has estimated their revenue as 410 billion whereas Chinese investment in the US uh, has estimated sales, Chinese affiliates in the US, 140 billion. So it's three times. And in terms of US companies, 15% of their market capitalization or roughly 2.5 trillion in value is at stake in China. So we're talking about, and in terms of the percentage of global sales for American companies, China comes, Chinese affiliates of American multinationals constitute 5% of global sales, whereas for Chinese firms in the US, it's only 1%. Although we all know that averages mask a big variation, no surprise. So that for some sectors like Chinese electronics and machinery, uh, they depend on the US for more than 7% of their revenue. And Deloitte has very kindly, this is something I couldn't do, because I'm not in a large consulting company. Uh, what they have done is identify specific sectors that are most at 
uh, risk in terms of supply chain. So we're talking now of supply chain risk. And in general, um, for, um, I mean, for both countries, the, there's a medium scale risk in aerospace, auto and telecom components, and a high supply chain risk in consumer electronics and telecom equipment. And you can read this on your own. They, uh, I mean, in terms of the high supply chain risk, we're talking about four American companies, enterprise electronics, consumer electronics, and telecommunications equipment. And also for Chinese firms, look how interrelated the countries have become. Enterprise electronics, consumer electronics, and telecommunications equipment. So there's a mutual vulnerability there. And regrettably, there's now the beginnings of a decoupling or disengagement, especially in telecommunications. Uh, this is something I put together to argue that if you look only at trade data, it is just half the picture because trade is one side of the coin and FDI or foreign direct investment is the other side of the coin. So looking at only trade statistics is scary to less than fully informed politicians in the United States. Let me give you an example. These, uh, these are numbers from 2017-18. So if you look at uh, category uh, A, this is American exports to China, 187 billion. Let's look at category C, Chinese exports to the United States, 524 billion. So if you look only at trade, C minus A gives us a rather scary trade deficit of 337 billion. But my argument is that's only one side of the coin. Let's put it together from the consumer's point of view. From the Chinese consumer's point of view, the so-called American or you know, US company goods would be A plus B. A of course is uh, Im imports from the United States, but B, is the sales by American multinational companies in the Chinese domestic market. And that was around 275 billion. Again, these are rather soft estimates, but I think they're in the ballpark. So if you add A plus B from the eyes of the Chinese consumer buying so-called American products, you're looking at 462 billion. Similarly, from the eyes of the American customer, buying so-called Chinese items through either C or D, C being direct imports, D being sales by Chinese companies in the US, the, the C plus D adds up to 538 billion. And the point I'm trying to make is that the combined picture is much more, much less frightening. It's not entirely balanced because you still have a bit of a difference between 462 billion and 538 billion, but it's much less frightening than the trade deficit looked at alone. Here's another example of how trade statistics can mislead. And the, this is data for the iPhone 7. I know that's uh, very old, what about five years ago? But Apple Incorporated is understandably hesitant to now disclose these kinds of information. Why? Because if you look only at the upper half of the slide, it makes Apple look very bad. It makes Apple look bad because the iPhone 7 alone was said to have caused a 11.16 billion trade deficit. Just one product from one company, 11.16 billion trade deficit. And why? 61 million was the volume exported from the Foxconn factory to the United States at a value, export value of $258 each. So 61 times 258, we're looking at 15.74 billion import figure, which goes into the import data statistic. Well, there are some American made components, $75 worth. So 75 multiplied by 61 million, you're looking at exports going westward across the Pacific Ocean, amounting to 4.58 billion. 15.74 minus 4.58, you're looking at a trade deficit of 11.16 billion created by just one product from one company. Now you can see why Apple is rather sensitive about this issue and I think they're discouraging people from finding out this kind of information. 
But if you do a value added comparison, then the value added in China is what? Well, remember the, uh, well, uh, sorry, uh, Apple pays Foxconn $10 for each assembly, for each unit. And there are other $29 worth of components uh, sourced in China. So the total value added in China, let's say is $39 multiplied by 61 million, you're looking at 2.38 billion. Similarly, we ask what is the value added in the United States for the iPhone 7? And the answer is remember the $75 figure for American components, multiply that by 61 million, you're looking at 4.58 billion. So on a value added comparison, the US actually has a surplus, which is quite the opposite picture from if you look at trade data alone. And that's not the end of the story because the retail price or value of the iPhone 7 was something like $649. So then the question is 649 minus the 258 paid by Apple to Foxconn gives a margin of $391 at Apple Inc. in the United States. And I asked my students this uh, rather silly question, is $391 uh, the profit margin earned by Apple on each iPhone? And the answer is of course not, because out of this $391 margin, Apple has to pay for its brilliant R&D people, its designers, its marketing, its advertising, and only then what's left over, you can call pure profit for Apple. So the point is if you include the R&D, the design, the marketing, et cetera, value added in the US, overwhelmingly the value of the iPhone 7 is added in the United States and not in China. So the point I was trying to make is you see how trade statistics can mislead and unnecessarily scare uh, less than fully informed politicians. Uh, my next slide is going to talk about how much does the American consumer spend on Chinese products. If you believe some politicians, uh, you know, everywhere you look in the United States, especially in Walmart, which is a low end uh, product uh, store, meaning a mass marketing, you think that everything is made in China, but actually the figure is uh, very little. According to the San Francisco Federal Reserve Board, final goods imported from China constituted only 1.2% of household consumer expenditures. Um, another, um, from this, another piece of data from the Census Bureau says it was 2.7% only. Of course, those figures add up to something. So let's uh, look at the numbers. Total consumer spending in the United States each year is something like 12.6 trillion in 2019. Of that, let's say 30% is in goods. The rest is in services. So 30% of 12.6 trillion is 3,780 billion. If we take the 2.7% figure from the Census Bureau in the United States, multiply 3780 by 0 0.027, we get an estimate of 102 billion made in China imports on which American consumers spend money. There's a high estimate. If we go back to the trade data, we notice that imports from China, uh, 452 billion, and divide that by the 12,600 expenditure, you're looking at a 3.59% that the American consumer on average is supposed to spend on Chinese made products. So the conclusion is overall, despite what uh, people might say either in the White House or in Congress, Americans actually spend very little on Chinese imported goods. So then the question is, uh, what about American manufacturing? And this is from the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. And you can see that in 1979, the number of manufacturing jobs in the United States reached a peak of 19.5 or almost 20,000, uh, I'm sorry, 20 million. This is in thousands of persons. 
But the number of jobs has declined precipitously to around uh, 12 million by the year uh, 2018. Not only that, but the red line shows a graph all the way from 1940 to the present or near the present. And you can see it's an inexorable downward trend. And the point I'm trying to make is that China only joined the WTO in December of 2001. So you can't possibly accuse China of being responsible for the decline in American manufacturing jobs from the 1940s all the way to 2001. That was a natural process, which I will shortly describe. This graph is saying the same thing, that even recently, even over this six uh, or seven year period from 2010 to 2016, while American manufacturing output kept increasing, and by the way, it's a record high. Have I skipped over some slides here? What's going on? Um, I'm sorry about that. Let me go back a bit. I think, uh, yeah, I did skip over some slides. I think uh, either my cursor. So if, if you will bear with me, I'll go back to slide number 24, which is provoked by this statement by the president of the United States that it will bring, bring Jews back from China. And, and uh, I did a hypothetical calculation. What would happen, hypothetically speaking, if Chinese imports were replaced entirely by US production. Of course, that's not going to happen because as I say in this slide, uh, relocation is not going to happen back from China. The jobs are, we know, going from China to Vietnam, Bangladesh, et cetera, because with the rising labor costs in China, Chinese companies are themselves abandoning production in the US and doing their own foreign direct investment in Vietnam, Bangladesh, in order to take advantage of uh, cheaper uh, wages and also to circumvent, I guess, the threatened uh, the, or real Trump, Trump tariffs. So I did a hypothetical calculation here saying, what would happen if Chinese imports were stopped and replaced by American uh, production? So uh, if you look at the Chinese labor content in the 102.6 billion in imports, you're looking at 30 billion in Chinese wages. American wages are eight times Chinese wages. And therefore, if we multiply that 30.62 billion by eight, we get equivalent US wages of 244.9 billion. Subtract from that the Chinese wages, and you're talking about additional wage cost of 214 billion. And the number of households, as I've said earlier, is about 124 million. And therefore, dividing the numbers, we get an extra cost of $1,728 per household per year if Chinese imports were stopped and replaced by US production. There's a high estimate from the previous slide Remember the high estimate from the previous slide was 3.59%, whereas the low estimate was 2.7%. So the high estimate would mean, just to cut a long story short, take the 728 number and multiply it by 3.59 over 2.7, and we're talking about $2,298 per household additional cost if Chinese imports were stopped and everything was produced in the United States. Now for affluent Americans, around $2,000 extra cost per year per household is not, it's manageable. It's not a big deal. But the bottom 30% of Americans, it would be a burden. And in fact, there are millions and millions of Americans who live on only about $30,000 a year income. So for them to pay this extra cost would be a big burden. And nobody talks about this, that the burden of tariffs, the burden of uh, any kind of disruption is disproportionately borne by the lower income segments of the population. Anyway, let me move to uh, US manufacturing uh, 
most people don't realize this, certainly in the United States, that it wasn't until 2011, recently, that China overtook the US as the number one manufacturer in the world. You know, most people don't realize that until recently, the US was the biggest manufacturer in the world. There's nothing wrong with American manufacturing. And uh, just to make reinforce my point, another graph from the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. And you can see that American manufacturing output value continues to increase. Of course, there are dips in recessions like the 2008 recession. But until January 2020, American manufacturing was at a record high and not too far behind China, which overtook the US in uh, 2011. But these are figures from 2019. The US is a very close second, even beating Japan, Germany, et cetera. So this is a list of the top manufacturing countries in the world. Of course, as a side comment, I mean, I'm just going off in a bit of a side discussion here. The kinds of things that China manufactures, especially for exports, compared to the kinds of things that the US manufactures, it's a bit different. So here is your company from Ningbo, Ningbo Yangfa Industry Limited, which is advertised on Alibaba or whatever. Uh, to American importers saying, if you order at least a thousand units, the average cost of the toaster will be between five and ten dollars per unit. And the average cost of a Boeing 737, actually these are depressed prices because you know some of them crashed, is 82 million. So actually one Boeing 737 is equivalent to 10.9 million Chinese toasters. Now, I know, I know very well that China has upgraded its technology and in certain areas is on par or let's say in ele electric vehicles and solar and so on is actually ahead of the United States. But still, for the most part, what China manufactures and exports to the world is basic stuff like toasters and not high tech, high tech stuff like Boeing aircraft. Although having said that, I know many, what many of you are thinking. You're thinking of a Chinese company called Comac, which is just about to, or has already, uh, uh, come up with a prototype of a more than 100 seat commercial aircraft. So China is coming up in the world, we all know that, but I'm just making a statement that in a way to compare the 2 trillion with the 1.8 trillion figure, is uh, not the complete story because the composition of Chinese manufacturers versus US manufacturers is somewhat different. Anyway, we were I, was, I was talking about this slide. Somehow the, my cursor must have jumped to this one. And the point is that, the point is, that American manufacturing jobs have been declining, not just since China joined the WTO in 2001, but all the way back from the 1940s. So what's going on? What explains the fact that, that manufacturing output of the United States keeps going up, up, up every year, at least until January of this year, and then we know what happened where manufacturing jobs uh, keep going down. This is a paper that is forthcoming in management and organization review. It's been just been accepted. And I talk about things like the root cause of the offshoring automation and, you know, a, a root cause of decline of manufacturing jobs and the visible effects are in the bottom half of the US population declining or stagnant living standards. You know, something really psychologically traumatic has happened in the United States. For more than 200 years until 2014, if you asked parents, will your children, will your children be better off? They would say yes. 
But Pew Research Center, which is a big uh, polling company in the United States, did a survey in 2014 and 2015 onward, et cetera. And they found that now less than one half of parents answer that question positively. And uh, I think the most recent survey, only 37% of American parents said that their children are expected to be better off than themselves. And that is psychologically devastating for a country that for more than two centuries has seen this continuous expectation that the American dream that the children would be better off than their parents. And no surprise then that that then results in political fragmentation uh, the way people voted in 2016, nationalism and the rise in protectionism, etc. So these are the visible effects. Now, what are the symptoms? Is the reduction not in manufacturing output, but in manufacturing jobs? Is it because of offshoring of jobs from the United States to China? Or is it because of automation and robotics? Or is it because of number three, information technology? or number four, squeeze on American worker wages. Actually, all four of these come into play. But uh, I think that in my opinion, and scholars are beginning to study this question, number two is the biggest culprit, automation. And why, why would companies offshore or automate? Because of hyper competition and cost cutting pressures. Um, so let me give you an idea of uh, the effects of automation. The effects of automation are the fact that Amer the United States manufacturing is way and away the most productive in the world. Even though in the US, these are somewhat old figures, but nothing much has changed. <clears throat> Today, the average American manufacturing worker in including benefits, earns $34 every hour, $37 every hour now. Despite that very high wage, look at this. The value added per employee per year is way and away the highest in the world. No, even number two, Japan is not close, and Germany is number three, and China is only 13.7. These are 2010 numbers. And by the way, I've tried to get new numbers, but for some reason, the Bureau of Labor Statistics in the United States says, uh, you know, stop revealing these data, maybe because it's politically sensitive. Even in terms of value added per hour worked, $73 per hour worked by an American worker, $59 per hour worked value added by the German worker, and in China, 7.19. However, there is one productivity index where China comes out on top. You can see that over here, which is the value added in dollars divided by the wages paid to the Chinese worker. And no surprise that come, China comes out on top because the denominator of the ratio is so low because Chinese wages are considerably lower. And the question I ask here is who started this whole cycle of offshoring? Was it Chinese exporters who first sold cheap goods to the United States and Europe, and then as a competitive reaction, American and European multinational firms offshored, began to offshore to China? Or was this whole thing started by US and European multinationals first, and only later local Chinese exporters followed suit? Well, the answer is the second, because if you look at this graph, in 1990, the blue line is exports from China. This is the sh percentage share of China's exports and imports done by foreign multinational enterprises. In 1990, it was only 12%. But between 2000 and 2012, more than half of China's exports were done by foreign multinational company affiliates in China. So I would say that the conclusion is that uh, it's American and European multinationals themselves who started this offshoring game, as it were. So the Chinese may be right in saying, don't blame us for the trade deficit. You guys, your companies came to our country, China, and started doing this. Anyway, very quickly, uh, Deloitte, 
in terms of competitiveness of manufacturing countries. Notice that in 2016, they put China number one, the US a close number two. For 2020, they're putting the US first and China a close number two. Because we should not forget that the United States is and remains the world's most innovative, productive, flexible economy. Um, let me move to the next one, which is the exchange rate history of the RMB. Many people don't realize that under Deng Xiaoping or even his predecessors, the RMB was only two per dollar and then followed under Deng Xiaoping and Jiang Zemin, et cetera, a deliberate, massive, five-fold devaluation of the RMB from two to 8.8. .8. And then it settled for 10 years between 1995 and 2005 at around 8.27. And then in June of 2005, under the tremendous pressure from Washington and Brussels, the Chinese government began to appreciate, you notice that appreciation is downward in this graph of the RMB. And then they held it between 6.0 and 7.0 for about 10 years until August of 2019 when it breached 7.0. And either the man does not sleep at night or somebody woke him up, but Donald Trump at five in the morning shot off a tweet saying that uh, China has breached uh, the implicit promise of keeping the RMB uh, within 7.0. It reached 7.05 on the 5th of August. And that therefore I want to declare China to be a currency manipulator. And what do we mean by currency manipulation? When we say, when the allegation is that the Chinese RMB is undervalued, what does that mean? Undervalued against what? Answer, the theoretical purchasing power parity exchange rate calculated by economists in the OECD or the IMF, where for 2019, for example, they would say that hypothetically speaking, in the absence of market distortions in the exchange market, the RMB should have been 4.198, instead of being something like 6 point whatever. Today it's uh, 6.8 or 6.7, something in that range. Of course, the World Bank has different calculation. They say that according to their economists, the RMB is not that much undervalued. And we don't have time to, I, I don't have time right now to talk about why is there a difference in the calculation between economists. Uh, the point is that for many Chinese companies with the rise in costs and especially labor costs, many Chinese companies have a break-even exchange rate of 5.9 RMB per US dollar. So if the uh, RMB were to appreciate, be appreciated by the PBOC, the People's Bank of China, to above 5.9, hundreds, maybe thousands of Chinese exporters would not be able to do business. But at the same token, by the same token, the Chinese government doesn't want the RMB to devalue too much either, because that would trigger an outflow of, uh, of capital I don't have time to talk about that. So they're holding it today at something like 6.7. This slide is talking about the dollar surplus recycling into US uh, treasury debt, into corporate debt, into agency debt, and US equity or share market. Very quick conclusions. Most of the assets are held by American citizens and American entities. Chinese holdings of US government debt, if we multiply this 0.29 figure by the 0.173 factor, we're talking about at most 5%. And even if you add the third party or Hong Kong or Cayman Islands kind of investment, meaning Chinese won't directly bid at the auction, but go through third parties. Even then you're looking at no more than 8% in my estimate of Chinese investment in US treasury bonds. And this kind of foreign buying of US assets reduces interest rates in the United States, which is a good thing for American consumers who have mortgages and car payments. It maintains the value of the US dollar. Um, 
How are we doing on time? I know we are approaching 55 minutes since I began. Shall I continue or stop? I'm sorry, I can't respond to chats. I, it's just too much for me with the screen share. So just speak up. I mean, I can, I can go, can I go for another, another 15 minutes? Would, would that be sensible, desirable or not? Yes, please. Yes, please. That's be okay. good. That's be good. Okay, That'd thank you. Desirable. So what I have here is the, uh, you know, how, uh, how sensitive is, is Chinese FDI? Chinese FDI. Uh, I'm, somebody uh, please. Uh, uh, is that right? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, but. Yeah, I can hear you, but. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, another 10 to 15 minutes is fine. Okay. okay. Thank you. So if you can please so mute. Can please mute. Um, what I have is uh, figures from a consultancy called the Rhodium Group, which studies Chinese investment in the United States. And uh, you can see from their list of sectors in which China has invested, most are rather innocuous, real estate and hospitality, transport and infrastructure, entertainment, agriculture, pork. Uh, and yes, there, are, there is ICT over here. And of course, we all know about the spat between the Trump administration and Huawei. So that is a significant factor, but most of the other areas are rather innocuous. On the left-hand column, we have uh, information from a rather conservative uh, think tank, the American Enterprise Institute. And uh, what I did was go to their website and I looked up the largest 20 Chinese investments in the US between 2019 and 2017, which are bigger than 2 billion. And so we're looking at aircraft leasing, food, um, entertainment, textiles, tourism, and so on. And even in the technology sector, you're talking about companies like Lexmark, IBM, computer division purchased by Lenovo, et cetera. So yes, there is the big concern about uh, ICT sector, information and communication technology. But for the most part, uh, most of the other sectors are innocuous. Um, in terms of China's uh, technology ambitions, the strategic significance of patenting, actually this is a paper I wrote, I've cited it over here in Journal of International Business Studies, which is the number one journal for uh, the Inter Academy of International Business and one of the top management journals, by the way. And what I'm finding is that the importance of patenting is reducing and the importance of trade secrets is increasing. You can read the reasons uh, from my article. And what we have seen over, not just recently, but historically since the 1970s or 80s, is the Chinese insistence that there be local JV partners and reverse engineering. And according to the Wall Street Journal, a senior policy maker in Beijing, they didn't give the name in the newspaper, but here's a presumably accurate quote. China's offer to the world has been straightforward. Foreign companies are allowed to access China's markets, but they would need to contribute something in return, i.e. their technology. So I think the Chinese government is not making any bones about their ambitions. In terms of cybersecurity, I mean, I, I suspected this even before the recent issue of The Economist magazine, that the US government's cyber abilities are the best in the world, with China a close second, of course. But there is actually an asymmetry. For ethical and legal reasons, American agencies like the CIA cannot, or they're not supposed to share commercial secrets with American companies. By contrast, the Chinese government openly says that it is our national duty to help our Chinese companies. So that's what I mean by the asymmetry. In this slide, I'm talking about uh, technology leakage being a very, very old story. Uh, for example, there was a man called Samuel Slater, 
who uh, stole textile technology secrets out of Britain when it was almost a capital punishment or at least transportation to Australia if you leaked uh, textile technology to the United States. But anyway, he emigrated to the US carrying tools and plans and Americans have called him the father of the American Industrial Revolution. The British called him Slater the traitor. And anyway, here's an even older story. Silk production was a closely guarded secret in China until 552 AD, when two visiting monks smuggled silkworms back in hollow walking sticks back to Byzantium. And of course, China had a monopoly on tea until 1861, and many people tried to smuggle out tea plants from China to other countries. It didn't work. Actually, what happened was that a British guy on the southern foothills of the Himalayas found a similar plant in 1861. I'm going to wrap this up. Anyway, uh, so yes, this has been going on. You know, leakage of technology has been going on for centuries, but in the 21st century, it's a much more serious matter because R&D sales ratios have dramatically increased. The core competence of companies resides, resides not in their physical assets, but in internal trade secrets. And China, on the one hand, portrays itself as upholding global rules, as a champion of globalization, an orderly rules-based society, harmony and cooperation with neighbors. But the Made in China 2025 plan is really what has spooked the American administration. Just to change topics, talking about dumping. Dumping come, comes about because, especially after 2010, when Chinese government pumped a lot of money into steel and aluminum companies, there was a huge amount of overcapacity. And when you have overcapacity, you can export at very close to your variable cost, which makes you look like dumping. Uh, the big, one of the biggest Chinese uh, aluminum companies is Zhongwang Holdings. And here's this man called Liu Zhongtiang, who is also, by the way, a citizen of Malta. And uh, all kinds of funny stories have been in the American press that $5 billion worth of aluminum inventory. Here's a drone picture sitting in the Mexican desert in Vietnam. Uh, and the government of the US has indicted him just a couple of months ago, accusing him of cheating on tariffs and dumping. And so I often wonder what this is all about. Was it really about tariff cheating? Because he, they recast some of the aluminum ingots into different shapes, which attract the lower tariff. Or was it just a way for Zhong Tiang or Liu to get money out of China? Because we know that there's a lot of wealth bottled up in China. Anyway, I'm going to conclude now. These are my last slides. The two nations account for 40% of world GDP, 23% of the world population. Over the last uh, 40 years, it's been a very happy and mutually beneficial relationship for both countries. China has benefited enormously. I mean, just in trade exports, China has 130 million Chinese, of which 17 million are working for the US exports, exports to the US. And here's a wonderfully happy story. I'm thrilled with this, that the percentage of Chinese population living in grinding poverty is now something like 3%, maybe only in Guizhou province. Uh, there are a few people in the mountains who are below the World Bank's criterion of $1.90 per person per day. So this is something we can all rejoice and be happy in. Um, and um, just to summarize, we were talking about, hypothetically speaking, between $1,700 and $2,300 extra for the American consumer if jobs indeed came back to the United States in manufacturing, which, which they won't. Um, China's participation has benefited not only US customers, but also benefited uh, the dollar, it's benefited US interest rates. And job losses in US manufacturing are mostly due to automation and robotics rather than to out offshoring. Um, the few, 
in the in the future, well, how can we return to mutually beneficial policies? Well, in my opinion, the U.S. government under Trump has really overdone its almost psychosomatic fears and worries about competition, particularly from China and losing its ranking in the world, etc. By the same token, I think the Chinese government is also overdoing it. And in its own dreams, it has, um, I mean, you can comment on this as an inferiority complex. And all these things about the wolf warriors uh, depicted on Chinese media, it's almost as if uh, uh, it's like a teenager who has recently developed muscles, despite the fact that China is one of the world's oldest civilizations, so there should be wisdom and moderation. 18 countries claim that China has uh, designs on their territory or their sea. Um, I guess what I'm saying is that life is full of inverted U-shaped curves like this. That you do something up to a point is good. So even nationalism, protectionism, caution, suspicion, irritation up to a point are okay. They're good. But then beyond an optimum point, if you overdo it, and I think both countries are overdoing it, then you go into the negative zone where the costs exceed the benefits. So this is my second to last slide. Uh, Confucius and the Buddha are talking about uh, love being much more productive than hate. And let's not forget that there remain enormous economic complementarities and synergies between the two countries. There's no fundamental or structural reason why I should conflict or disagreement. Even in some sectors like communications technology, there's an unfortunate division. In the vast majority of sectors, uh, you know, there should be healthy competition. And competition we all know as business professors and students is healthy. It, uh, it increases uh, innovation. We believe in the virtues of competition. As long as it is based on mutual respect and common rules. So I conclude, thank you for your kind attention and be happy to have a discussion and the panel panelists reaction and comments thank you very much yeah. all right well thank, thank you very much, much. Thank you very much. okay yeah thank you all right so uh yeah uh, we have uh, you know uh, quite some time for panel discussion and also for q and um, you know, there's actually a question in the chat room and which I think, you know, uh, you can, we probably can uh, use and to start the discussion. Please read, okay. Please read, please read it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sure, sure. I'll try and get uh, the chat. But I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, Farouk, you uh, have provided, uh, in fact, a lot of uh, uh, you know, very and uh, insightful, good statistics. Uh, some of the data are not so obvious. Uh, and then there's a question, um, you know, your statistics, whether they include. So the question is uh, whether Hong Kong is included or not, uh, because USA tends to have a uh, trade service surplus uh, with Hong Kong. And then the other question is uh, whether some of the, uh, it's related, um, some of the FDI affiliates are hidden affiliates, for example, and US companies may have, uh, you know, subsidiaries in Hong Kong tax havens, and then re re they reinvest in China. And the same can be applied to Chinese companies as well. Okay, uh, Farouk, I think, you know, you may want to just respond to that quickly. Yeah, quick answer. Yeah, quick so far, so far, the China, Hong Kong is China, considered Hong Kong is a separate, separate, country. Country. A separate country. In terms of UN terms and of World Bank, there's an echo, by the way. There's an echo, by the way. 
So anyway, my answer is no. In mainland China. Statistics. So the data I get from the from the World Bank, from the mainland China. Okay. Uh, Farrell, can you get a little closer to your microphone? Yeah. Can you hear me better yeah. now? Can you hear me better now? Uh, yes. My data is only My for me because at least so far, both the U.S. government and the U.S. Bank, bank, IMF, etc., consider, consider want to be separate. So my data is only for my data is only for the U.S. Okay. All right. Uh, great. All right. Uh, so uh, I was wondering, you know, and we don't need to have the order. So any uh, panel member uh, want to give uh, either a quick comment uh, or uh, ask questions? Okay. Uh, okay. Professor, I, I would say uh, because uh, we can silence your microphone. And actually, I'm uh, in a PG uh, course, the last meeting for my PG course in this semester. The topic, Professor Contractor, is on your favorite. Actually, you made your name about technology transfer. So I asked them to understand your work. Actually, this uh, meeting, we asked them to read uh, four papers, right? and from macro and also to the basis. One is the Journal of Economic Literature in 2004, published paper, International Technology Diffusion. Right? Uh, why, why, by the way, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the, the US-China relationship, but one of your topic about technology, right, high tech. Uh, you know, the Trump administration asked the Trade Representative Office to issue, to investigate and 301 on China's trade practices. Actually, the report come up in 2018, nothing, almost nothing talk about trade deficit. The four point reads as a report, all related to technology. Intellectual property infringement, forced technology transfer, cyber theft, and innovation policy. Nothing to do about trade. So what actually I mean get interested is why this and actually you see by reading the papers talk about actually uh, the productivity growth of rice nation cross countries 90% are contributed to foreign technology. Actually that essentially the technology flow across the borders are common phenomenon right a common phenomenon. So, okay, okay, of course, ask them to read annual das capta knowledge flow among multinationals. My, my, of course, your early time in the technology transfers, that is an inter form, royalty setting and, and other things, right? But actually, currently, there are a lot of intra firm. I'm thinking of this typically, we, we think about that when I, of course, one topic of the economics of multinationals. multinationals. Actually, economic multinational, economic multinational enterprises to be existent largely due to the transfer, the firm specific intangibles across borders. Right? That's why the multinational exists, well, FDI. But so that natural for multinational from US, from Japan, transfers technology into China. So that's why China made enormous technical growth. But the problem now is that, uh, uh, of course, I just uh, ask your opinion, right? Ask your opinion. I, I, there is a, 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 uh, you as a really authoritative, very authoritative person in that regard, right? What can you see? Because that's a contradictory issue. For first, multinational to be strong in market like China, right? They must have technological flow, right? On the other hand, the in the international relations between countries. Uh, yes, there are some political and other part of the opinion. Uh, sometimes block or the opinion. That what what? How can we reconcile 
that uh, motivation for multinational enterprises to engage such kind of thing, or the politicians or political whales to somewhat uh, uh, get into between. Right, that's uh, my question also, uh, my, my plea. Thank you. I, I'll, I'll show that uh, my, uh, my uh, let me see, that the, uh, the, the, the PG students, they are uh, studying, Hello. they are listening, they are following this. This, uh, this is a, a seminar. A seminar. May I respond? Uh, yeah, OK. Um, actually, uh, can I just can I just add one one quick thing related to and uh, Professor Chang Chi Wu's question? Uh, so uh, I actually uh, published one article uh, more than ten years ago, uh, you know, uh, addressing uh, the uh, resources or information flow uh, between uh, the uh, foreign multinationals and Chinese companies using the cap social capital theory. So basically, the idea is, I mean, companies, they are following economic principles. Okay, the technology, information, or resources will, will flow uh, naturally and uh, to, uh, you know, the, the weak partners uh, in the process. Okay, so, so anyway, yeah, uh, Fero, back to you. Okay, can I be, am, am I being heard? You can hear me, okay. Yes, Professor Wu has uh, put his finger on the critical tension within multinational companies. On the one hand, in order for the foreign subsidiary or affiliate to succeed, they have to transfer technology, regardless of whether the government insists on it or the local partner insists on it, just for self-interest. You want to help your foreign subsidiary or your licensee to be able to produce. On the other hand, if you disclose too much, then you can give away your crown jewels. That's the tension I actually discuss in the 2019 Jibs paper of mine, which talks about the optimum degree of disclosure. I mean, it's a theoretical paradigm, but companies are constantly battling this issue how much to disclose in order to make our foreign operation succeed in its business, but how much not to disclose in order to give away our crown jewels. That's one thing. The second observation I have is that Chinese uh, people are very hardworking and clever, technologically capable of absorbing, absorbing technology, which is also a good thing. But what I think that some American companies and the Trump administration object to is hacking into areas which the American or European firm deliberately says we don't want anybody to see. We want them to see this part, but we don't want them to see this part. We want to keep it close to our chest. So that's what they are objecting to, the, uh, the prying and the, you know, the so on. But even that uh, is some, somewhat very difficult to prevent. Let's say you have a Chinese engineer working for the European company affiliate in China. The engineer will learn. They're clever people. They're capable people and quit the job and go to a competitor. And yes, there are such things I discuss in my article as non-disclosure agreements, but they're really not enforceable even in the United States effectively. So technology is going to leak out. So I return to my original comment, which is that there's an internal inevitable tension between the desire to share technology in order to make your foreign operation succeed versus the danger or the fear of disclosing too much and uh, losing your technical lead over the rest of the world. So the optimum disclosure point, that's the paradigm I see in my 2019 JIBS article. Yes, also uh, as a follow up, this is a intellectual property, right? I think you mentioned, I think my understanding your most recent paper uh, talk about actually there's some, this for the company, multinational company to decide which part they want to keep it a secret. No. Know how and other part they may apply for intellectual property. 
the patent and other things, right? And uh, maybe licensing, they get to receive some royalties based on the licensing fee and otherwise, right, the income, right? That's good, very thank you. So my, my point is in the article, you can read more that companies are now getting more and more concerned or shying away from patenting for reasons I discussed, because patents are not always enforceable. The very act of filing a patent can disclose too much to your competitors, et cetera, et cetera. And instead, so there's been a shying away from patenting and more trade secrets. Yeah, trade secrets. Right. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't a record number of patents filed around the world, something like 4 million per year. And that is simply because uh, the patent filing fee is not that uh, much of an obstacle. So companies will file patents even if they know it's really not valuable or defensible because then it becomes a marketing thing. You put on your company puts on its website saying, oh, this is a patented item. It looks glamorous to viewers of the website. Mm -hmm. So because there's a greater emphasis in the last 10 years on trade secrets and a reduced emphasis on patents, uh, trade secrets are all the more critical as crown jewels and therefore they don't want the secrets to be hacked into or revealed to competitors, that's all. Yeah, yeah maybe I can in, uh, build on that and technology make Technology speed yeah. rapidly, right? The lead time probably is better than... Uh, okay, Martin. Yeah. yeah, maybe I can build on that and make a comment. Um, I think you can see uh, three things here. Uh, one is patents, which by their nature, you have to disclose a fair amount of information. It's the public domain. And you do this now internationally, you can see it on the internet from any country to any other country. In the past, you used to have to go to the patent office to look at it and things like that. So that information is now actually the cost of getting uh, information from patents is much lower. You've got that. You've then got actually the capacity that's embodied in people. So uh, do you have people who are able to, in a broad sense, reverse engineer? So it's good that people have the skills to be able to develop their own products that are the equivalent. And clearly that's where China has dramatically increased its capability. And if you, unless you adopt uh, a very stringent uh, company law that enables companies to restrict the right of people to move between companies, uh, then that is that will continue. In fact, when you look at it, that's the basis of Silicon Valley. The basis of what people say are the innovation clusters is because people move between firms, uh, not hopefully taking uh, formal trade secrets, but taking that capability. And that's what actually builds those clusters of innovation, like Silicon Valley. Then the third piece is what you've described as crown jewels of uh, trade secrets. Those only really exist in some industries. Um, and so it's not necessarily generic. So it may well differ quite a lot by industry. Uh, and I say there, it may be, the, the, for example, the knowledge of how to use a certain machine. I'll give an old example. When I was a student, there was, uh, this is for the central heating. If you do central heating, you have the uh, exhaust, which is usually uh, metal, but flexible. That was a trade secret. It wasn't patented. And what happened was there were always three or four companies that made it. And sooner or later, somebody who had the skill would go away and do, set up their own business. And actually, it was really a cartel. So if they succeeded, they joined the cartel afterwards. <laughs> that was what happened. This is, you know, so that's what I saw at that time. So, so this trade, you know, you've got the combination of... Uh, Patents and most intellectual property law yeah. is around patents. It's assuming a disclosure and then preventing. And many US companies did that in order to sue people <laughs> and enrich, I mean, enrich lawyers of the process in order to stop other people innovating mm -hmm. rather than necessarily to protect things. That's one trend. Mm -hmm. Now we're getting a trend towards trying to avoid disclosing that so that people can. Uh, maintain that. So I think there's, there's dilemmas in firms, it will differ by type of firm. And you can see that on the one hand, you've got the uh, 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 like a free trade, um, a free trade uh, approach says it should be open, uh, saleable, etc. The other tries to 
uh, stop that. Mm -hmm. And I think what we're going to need to see is actually some revision to the intellectual property regimes mm -hmm. that recognize this and also take into account uh, things like forced technology transfer and so on, what's reasonable. And I think that if you're looking at a US-China relationship, that means there's got to be a, what is seen as a reciprocal relationship that both sides abide by. That's the okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's very pertinent. Just one, one quick thing. Uh, in fact, uh, keeping the trade secrets, that's actually a very old traditional Chinese way. Okay, by the way. <laughs> All right. Um, and uh, I actually want to maybe ask uh, Andy, Andy uh, to, to share some insights uh, regarding uh, the IP uh, or technology uh, transfer or leakage. Uh, since Andy is uh, the chief security officer of Huawei Technologies, uh, I just want to know and whether you have, uh, you know, and uh, some, some uh, ideas, uh, insights to share uh, with the audience, with the panel. Andy? Thank you. There, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, to be with you, although virtually. I hope to be able to return to Beijing uh, uh, and Shenzhen uh, next year. Uh, there are so many issues that are worth discussing, and we don't have time to uh, to discuss very many of them. Um, so many excellent points uh, have been made. Hi, hi uh, Andy. Can you just hold on? Uh, Okay, my, my speaker's here. Okay. Uh, I can hear you. All right. Okay. Uh, uh, hi, hello, Andy. Yeah, you, you, can, you can go on, Andy. Um, so a couple, a couple things, and I think the, the point about trade secrets is, uh, uh, several points about trade secrets is very important. Huawei is one of the biggest patent filers in the world, but I think the, the points made about trade secrets are important. And, uh, in terms of the various issues that come up, and I, I sometimes talk with the media questions about uh, uh, IP theft, uh, about trade secret litigation. Um, the trade secrets is really the, uh, the, the tremendous emphasis. A couple points. Um, I think when you look at the perspective of where the United States is coming from, uh, the, uh, the fundamental concerns by both parties the Republicans and Democrats strongly agree, I'm not saying they're right, but they strongly agree that there are major issues about the fairness of Chinese trade, uh, about the fairness of forced technology transfer. Um, those are huge issues to both sides. Now you have the larger geopolitical situation um, and you have globalization. Well, as you know, globalization helped raise millions of people around the world out of poverty, but it left certain pockets, such as in the United States, pockets of people out of work. And even if some of the jobs are brought back, they'll make about 25% of what they got paid before. Um, and so the U.S. has failed to take the kind of approach to globalization that hopefully the U.S. is going to take relative to the, the technology competition with China. Uh, so for globalization, we should have known, and we saw over time, that certain numbers of Americans were put out of work as, as dislocations on other parts of the world. We in the US did not do anything about it. We, we did not take efforts to try to anticipate to try to train those employees. And now one of the things I'm encouraging is, and, and uh, Professor Contractor talked about the impact of automation on, on some of the increased efficiency of uh, American manufacturing uh, input, is I'm trying to recommend that the US needs a future of work strategy. That uh, looking forward in terms of the skills that American workers are going to need because of machine to machine automation, artificial intelligence, that there needs to be a strategy to help develop the skills of, of American workers and immigration policies to bring in qualified workers to have a strategy going forward about how can we make sure people have the training they need. Similarly, when you look at distance learning, and we have, I guess, a form of distance learning in, in, in this conversation uh, tonight, you look at in the US, the impact of the pandemic, marginal workers, underskilled, unskilled workers, not unlike some of the manufacturing folks who, who lost their jobs, they're the ones that lose their jobs the, the, the quickest. They're the ones who, as technology moves forward, are gonna be left behind. But America is starting to think about 
uh, distance training, but the idea of saying, let's help the unskilled and underskilled with traditional education, but also uh, you know, the, the kinds of skills you need for future of work, uh, the kinds of skills you need for plumbing and electrician and, and, and whatever. That, but secondly, the United States needs a technology industrial strategy. The United States is ahead of technology innovation vis-a-vis -vis China, but the US needs a private sector led strategy an industrial strategy for what makes the most sense for the United States to advance going forward. Uh, and those kinds of issues are, are too strategic. Uh, we have a tendency for our politicians to take the populist approach and look at short-term consequences and not look at the longer-term strategy of what's going to be necessary to allow the United States to maintain its competitive lead, and allow workers to continue to work, and make sure that we have discussions with China about those issues that we can reach agreement on. I'll give you one example, one of the major things that's important going forward in my view, and it was a report of the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace uh, out of Europe that reported a year ago. The idea of improving the ability to have attribution of cyber attacks of thefts of intellectual property. We need greater attribution, we need greater technical attribution. So, so independent groups, not governments, not the UN, but independent groups can say country X or country Y or group ABC are engaging in thefts of intellectual property. We have to have attribution, we have to hold people accountable, we have to stop this kind of conduct that's been going on forever. But we have to be strategic and we have to collaborate both globally and within our countries to do so. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Andy. Uh, but uh, I will follow up a little bit with Andy's uh, comments. That's great. Andy's comments are great because the cyberspace, intellectual property, and knowledge creation need to have a governance. But what I I heard that is that uh, I think five years ago, and uh, then at that time, President Xi Jinping proposed. Uh, to set up a discussion dialogue to set up a corp that is cyberspace governance structure in Wuzhen, in Wuzhen that I think it's the internet uh, forum something, but nobody responded. Uh, uh, to my knowledge, nobody responded. I think indeed, given that the world in such a way, they need something may or may not be like United Nations. The people need to discuss some, some governance rules and uh, principles. That, that was my follow-up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, let, me, let me briefly say, I, I want to echo that when you look at the work of the United Nations in international norms of conduct, it's been a lot of talking, a lot of talking. And look at what China recently proposed, the Global Initiative on Data Security, where some of the eight or ten principles that China proposed overlap with some of the principles of the UN experts group. We've got to get the groups together. We have to get countries and companies to sign mutual trust agreements. Some of the things China said they felt folks had to be committed to in that global initiative on data security are very, very important. But we need mutual trust agreements signed by governments and signed by companies so there are major financial consequences if they violate them, but you need stronger attribution so you know who to legitimately point the finger at. I have a question for Andy. Is it really possible to identify the hackers? Is it technically feasible? Well, let's put it this way. There, there are a couple things that are necessary. Uh, and uh, Ambassador Timor Koster, the cyber ambassador from the Netherlands, uh, has been leading an initiative. He just left the uh, government post. He was part of the Global Commission. There are folks working to improve the capability to do attribution. That's very important. But there are also technologies that are fundamentally important. I'll just cite the two fundamental concerns of the U.S. government relative to, to Huawei. One is backdoors, and the other is the the improper accessing of data and sending it back to China. There are technological capabilities that can be implemented where you can guarantee that the products don't have backdoors. You can guarantee that data is not improperly accessed and sent back to anybody, and Cisco's not sending data back to the United States or whatever. So if you can prove those things, bad things are not happening, then you can prove that the China government is not forcing us to do bad things. So if you combine attribution with those kinds of data protections, 
those kinds of security measures, those auditable measures, then you have an objective and transparent basis for knowing which products and services are worthy of trust, which is fundamental. Uh, all right. Uh, I want to just quickly follow up. And uh, uh, so, Farrakh, you have uh, presented uh, you have presented a lot of data, and as I mentioned, some of the data are not so obvious and to uh, many people. In fact, uh, it's really and the the opposite of many people's perception. Okay. And then Andy is talking about uh, you know uh, the the net technical aspects. So you have the technologies and the to do things. So now my, my question is this, in the recent uh, few years, uh, I don't know whether it will just end and uh, after the Trump administration, basically and the facts uh, become not so obvious because when, whenever you present facts, there are always you know, you know, alternative facts, uh, if you will. So that's why people feel like you know, it's difficult to actually uh, know the facts. So, so that's why my question is, and with the data available, for example, Farrakh, you have a lot of data, and Andy, you've got you know, technical data. Do you think uh, politicians uh, will listen, okay, and given the data? And this is for both uh, Farrakh and also for Andy. Um, I think the Trump administration has dug enough ground and thrown up enough mud and dirt that I don't think we can go back very quickly to any status quo ante. So even the Biden administration is going to continue to negotiate based on what Trump has done, but then be much more honorable, much more straightforward, much more direct than the previous administration. So but we, I would we cannot, suggest we cannot that on, go back to 2016. Unfortunately, on two fronts, and I, I, I do think the Biden administration will treat American allies with more respect than the current administration has done, uh, taking a more of a multilateral approach rather than a bilateral approach. Uh, and I think the idea of saying, okay, uh, what is important to the United States about Chinese companies being able to do business? And that, so American companies who are impacted, for example, the potential decoupling, the American supply chain, the semiconductors inability to sell to, to Chinese companies, that's gonna force China to create their own, and that's gonna hurt American companies. When you look at Europe, look at what Germany's doing, look at the work of the European Commission. They are developing mechanisms and measures to do the kind of thing I talked about, where you can have a basis for trust. You can then those countries can push back on the pressure from the United States that's saying, okay, don't allow these technologies because it will make you not safe. It'll be a national security threat. But if they can push back and they will be able to push back on the U.S. and say, no, we're going to continue to buy in some risk mitigated way. We're going to continue to buy these technologies. Stop putting pressure on us not to because we can address the risk because there's a tremendous financial impact. You look at the U.K., the fact that uh, we're not going to be allowed to sell there is going to impact several billion dollars us of the telecom operators and multiple billion dollars for the people of the uk so countries want to be able to push back uh, against the united states for the interests of their citizens and when they have objective measures in place where they can prove they're secure that's going to be possible Well, if, if indeed there are the technical developments in Germany that the U.S. can learn from, then I think uh, many people in the Biden administration would at least in, informally be open to investigating those possibilities. Well, I think that's right. And there's, there's, there's companies connected with the U.S. intelligence community, and you may know of them, uh, who have suggestions on what can be done right now because they have experience doing it as part of the CFIUS process, Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. And as I say to my, my colleagues who say, well, President Biden is in office soon, then uh, we'll be able to sell. I said, wait a second. Huawei will not be allowed to participate in the U.S. market under less restrictive conditions than Nokia and Ericsson. 
Nokia and Ericsson's products, as you may know, are evaluated under a government monitored risk mitigation program. Their products are tested before they're sold into the US telecommunications network. The committee of the team telecom supervises the evaluation of that. And so hopefully the, the Biden administration will be willing to talk with us about those kinds of measures. And as I said, there are companies close to the US intelligence community who know the capabilities that, that do in fact exist. But you're right, if, when Germany comes up with something that makes sense, uh, I think that will hold some sway. And you're right, Andy, that uh, the Trump tactics will only push China to accelerate its own internal technical development, which has already happened. Yeah, that's uh, indeed very talk about in one of the slides you mentioned about made in China, 20, made in China 2025, right? Actually, if that time, that sounds a little bit unwise. But now the fact turn into in, indeed seem to five side a uh, project. Because indeed, made in China 2025, why I think it's unwise? Because actually they set up the indigenous actually domestic shares, right? And the localization something. At that time, given that globalization, that that's may or may not be. But now you know, <laughs> The supply chain, high end, and the product and the machinery was sometimes blocked. Mm, yeah. The made, made in China 2025 is a wise decision now, right? Not, not because of original intention, but now with the many supply chain and the restrictions, you have to uh, get approval of this, get approval of that. So, what can you do, right? That's, I think, I myself do not buy made in China. China 2025. I think it's uh, not good for globalization. But now, you know, it's make itself a valid statement, right? That is uh, something really is hard to, hard to talk about. Okay. But you know, from the American perspective, uh, memories go back to the 2010s or 2012s when companies like Google effectively were barred from participating in the Chinese market. Now, maybe the Chinese will say it's, it's our country, our nationalism, it's, you know, who are you to tell us? But anyway, the memories go back to the exclusion of American uh, media and IT companies, uh, which is sort of, some would argue, I don't argue, but some would argue that set this rancor and this ball rolling of tit for tat. Mm -hmm. Oh, but, uh, uh, but uh, I, uh, I just want to add a little bit of thing, but we need, I think the information, a different kind of information, different kind of interpretation. Actually, in, particularly in the Google's case, and then other cases may not be true. Actually, Google voluntarily to pull out of China market, right, to Hong Kong, they all, all the special reputation of China. The idea behind it is the authorities asked Google to block certain information based on the Chinese law, right? Mm -hmm. And Google said, no, we will not do this. And uh, I'm not, they're not to comply. So they said, okay, fine. I'll pull out to have set quarter, some operations uh, based in Hong Kong. So that, that is a, uh, given that constraints and firms make their decision whether or not to provide a service, right? That is a, just minor, minor, they just want to clarify the situation, right? Not, not kick it out, but they withdraw. Right? Well, it's, okay. it's the, uh, it, it uh, comes down to the old uh, tension between national sovereignty and a government right, uh, right, right, indeed. to tell whatever uh, it wants to do in its own country versus multilateral or global commerce, which yeah, yeah, naturally indeed. wants to be free of uh, one country's uh, rules. So multinationals would, of course, ideally, we're not going to get there, ideally want a world where there's just one set of rules for all countries. Right. But okay. uh, I'll, I'll make two uh, I, I, quick yeah, points, good. and then we'll open the floor, okay? Uh, after just two quick points. Uh, number one, uh, well, Professor Chang Chi, you mentioned uh, Google's case. Uh, so actually, many people are, are saying, uh, in the case of Google, it's still negotiable, okay? But in the case of Huawei, it's non-negotiable. Okay, uh, so I guess that's the sort of difference. And second point is, 
Uh, Farouk, you're talking about differences between the Chinese government and U.S. government. You're saying, based on the ethical legal reasons, the U.S. government agencies uh, uh, do not share uh, information with private companies. Uh, I, actually, I would say uh, in, in China, probably people have this perception that Chinese governments uh, are willing to share a lot of information with companies. Uh, I am not sure that's true. Okay. Uh, of course, I don't have the authority to say otherwise, but I don't think that's really true. Okay. Uh, Chinese governments also share information with companies uh, very selectively. Okay. Uh, so anyway, and we, we just, we can leave it aside. Uh, we have a question from and uh, uh, one of the uh, participants in the room, in, in the conference room here. We'll, we'll start from this. Okay. Yeah, please. Uh, so hello, Professor. So I have a small question here that is because we say there are different data by different ways and you mentioned also if we decide the kind of uh, commerce deceive uh, late, uh, we probably have a billion, a millions and billions. But according if we use the consumption to calculate that, it's only probably 760 uh, billions here. So my question is that, is there a common consensus to calculate, uh, you know, something like that? Or, you know, only when a politician, a politic person needs this kind of data and we use this. So is there a global consensus about which kind of calculation method or, you know, this kind of data should be used? Derek, uh, I think that this is a question for you. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I can answer this question. Uh, there is no, I mean, what I did was fairly simple estimates, all said and done. Now, it is true that my, some of my conclusions are not known even to uh, politicians. And certainly, you know, American po politics says, you know, 400, 500 Congress people, 100 senators, thousands of staffers, very few of them would uh, really have come to the kinds of detailed conclusions that I came up with, unfortunately. Now, there are people in the Co Congressional Research Service and in consultancies like Deloitte or, or Rhodium Group where they do understand these things, but uh, there is no broad understanding of uh, some of the concepts I calculated. Which is which is why we have uh, 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 you know people talking past each other in American politics. I mean, this pay forthcoming paper in Management and Organization Review, I actually cite uh, a paper written by a politician who is making all kinds of uh, statements saying that American manufacturing and much of the American public believes that American manufacturing is in decline and in trouble, et cetera, when actually the opposite is true. Uh, okay, yeah, Yes, please. so sometimes like this says for Andy, because what is the meaning of this kind of data for, for, for like the Huawei, this kind of company it's involving in this kind of global commerce? What meaning of, do you use this kind of data to analyze? You know, or you know, to protect yourself from the some policy from America. And can somebody repeat that question? Oh, okay. Uh, so I guess uh, the question is whether you you were talking about data, okay? And are are you actually using the data and uh, for for the for the calculation, just like what Ferrex is doing, you know, and uh, by using you know uh, using a method of uh, of doing the data calculation. Are you doing this, Andy? For example, when it relates to Huawei, are you using the data, objective data, and to make your case? You're talking about using the data uh, in, in our business or using the data in terms of advocacy? Uh, you're, you're, in, in the case of Huawei, are you actually using object data to make your case? To protect you still from... What, what did he say? So, so, for example, when you talk to U.S. officials, U.S. you know agencies, oh. are you using the object data to make your case? No, the U.S. government has not been been willing to to uh, talk with us for quite some time. That's been the frustrating thing, and that that's the geopolitical situation. But for that situation, they would talk with us. 
whether we would have a positive outcome or not is, is a different story, but, but they would talk with us. Uh, and that's why we've had to rely on, uh, on, we have limitations on our ability to sell and limitations on our ability to buy in the United States. So we've had to rely on uh, the suppliers to try to put pressure. And we've had to rely on our customers to put pressure because it's important to the United States that they be able to do their business. But the U.S. government has not been willing to talk to us. And it was part of that where our customers found this company close to the U.S. intelligence community and they submitted a white paper to the FCC that laid out a very good approach for how you address cybersecurity risk and communications, much broader than really anything I've seen anywhere in the world. Well, my understanding okay. of the question, probably you just mentioned Nokia or Ericsson, their product must go through certain procedures in order to marketing, market that product in the U.S. Uh, market, right? Uh, there must be technical specifications or data to show how this. Would be why we also present that objective data verification. My understanding of the question is that to, to go through that. Did you just answer the question? Actually, they, just, they don't want to listen, right? This is the question. Right. Well, um, we were subject to a similar uh, arrangement as we were a supplier into Sprint uh, after SoftBank bought Sprint. So our products had to be subject to a CFIUS review and we did fine in the three years of, of, of that review. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the, the, that's when the pressure started to come down. That's when the U.S. government launched the China Initiative, which didn't get that much publicity, but it's where they're using every piece of government power to put pressure on China, including criminal indictments, civil cases, and, and the kinds of uh, restrictions on our ability to do business and ability to buy from American companies. So in those earlier years, we were able to, to provide data, and, and the U.S. government experts know that the, the, the risk is adequately addressed by the kinds of processes that were done. And there are additional things now in recent years that, that can be added to it uh, that can help the U.S. government getting data from us and our customers and from others. They can connect the dots and they can find anomalous conduct in, 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 in cyberspace uh, that can, can find uh, you know, national security risks. I have a question uh, for Andy. So I'm speaking from relative ignorance. I'm not an IT person. The question is, the fundamental objection seems to be the ability of telecom equipment to keep track of people's data, their movements, their contact list, et cetera. Now, two questions. First of all, isn't that something that all companies do, vacuum up and scoop up data on individual citizens in the United States or Europe? And the second question is, is the real difference the idea that Huawei would be sharing that personal data with the Chinese government? Well, the, 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 the fact is the nature of our business, we're not like a, an AT&T uh, or a CenturyLink or Verizon in terms of having access to the location data and that other kind of data. We sell, or at least we used to sell, you know, mobile handsets in, in the United States and we sell telecom equipment. So the data in, that we are involved in, uh, and there are very special precautions that we can't go into right now, um, the, uh, we have to provide software updates for our equipment and we sometimes have to service the equipment. So that requires making making contacts. In our world, you can see the U.S. government concerns in a publication that almost nobody sees. It's a Department of Defense publication called PRISM. There was an article in January by a former national security official that laid out the U.S. government's concern, national security concern about Huawei. So two of my colleagues and I, we got an article published in the same DOD publication, amazingly enough, of course, nobody reads those things, where we gave our response to those national security concerns, and we think we adequately addressed those concerns, and we had that published, I think, in September of this year. And so it was really pretty amazing they actually published the article. Uh, yeah, we have uh, actually some questions in the chat room, and uh, let me just uh, bring them up uh, quickly. So uh, one question is about, you know, why Made in China 2025 and uh, has scared the U.S. and uh, uh, European governments. And I, uh, well, uh, Farrakh and Andy, uh, you know, maybe you can share your thoughts. 
why uh, made in China 2025 and the scary uh, to US government and European governments? I wouldn't be scared. I would be happy because to the extent that Chinese technology can in a rules-based and open and healthy way force American companies to innovate even more, that's a good thing for both innovation and for customers. I would not be scared, but obviously the US being in a preeminent position so far, technologically, et cetera, uh, and if you have a, a, an administration that has a bit of a inferiority complex in the US and whatever psychosomatic problems, they are scared, some of them. But I think that healthy competition based on common rules is good. We shouldn't be scared about it. I think the US government is definitely afraid of the Chinese government, uh, not just in terms of economic competition, technology competition, but in terms of their concern that, you know, frankly, I think they, they think that China wants to take over the world and they want to use economic pressure to countries around the world to get them to go into the sphere of influence of China so China can do more of, of, of what they want to do. Uh, I think many in America are very much afraid of the 2025 uh, information. And I'm not sure how much of that is really for domestic consumption in China more than it is for international consumption. Uh, and and, and I, I don't think the U.S. picks up those nuances, but I think to some extent it's that, that anything big that happens in China, the U.S. believes it's the China government. And so if China 2025 means everything is China, everything is made in China, it just gives more power to the China government. So I think the fears are, are related. Yeah. Um, I think what I'd say is that some of the concerns are reasonable um, because people are not confident that there would be, in a sense, a rules-based multilateral uh, fairness. I mean, people, if you take smaller countries, they're concerned about the US, they're also concerned about China targeting particular industries with effective subsidies, which has happened in the US over many years through Department of Defense contracts in emerging areas and so on. And similarly in China, they, 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 they're concerned about that. So therefore, uh, and also US and China, that, there's, uh, that, that people are not following a, a set of rules and therefore people will cherry pick particular industries to give them an advantage where there's a first mover, get the first mover advantage, and then get longer term. So there's concern about that. The answer to that is actually to have stronger multilateral rules and understandings and trust combined with greater competition. That's the way to deal with it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think some of the concerns are reasonable, um, but it doesn't mean they can't be overcome. Okay. Uh, I, I would uh, yeah. uh, mention about made in China among Chinese scholars, particularly IB scholars. We would advocate, uh, we would advocate open market, fair competition, no severe visible hand to intervene. Actually, I just in a class to talk about that. You see, that telecommunication equipment manufacturing sector is just like this case. Is the beginning when China opens the door. This is. A, most widely open sector with Nokia, with Ericsson, with Motorola, with Nortel, with uh, Siemens, with uh, uh, Japanese, some other companies. Mm -hmm. But in the end, but the very open market generate company like Huawei, like ZTE, that come up with open market. But on the other hand, some automobiles, at about the, and China, Chinese government set a barrier, you have drawn that actually essentially the companies, at least the domestic <laughs> industrial companies do not fly. So we advocate open market, open competition. Of course, the politicians and policymakers desire to do something, trying to protect. Actually, in the end, it does not work. So I just often use telecom equipment manufacturing and automobiles. The China's automobile industry is still dominated by foreign brand. But Huawei out of most widely open sector, right? Telecommunication manufacturing sector, right? That is a, 
So the, of course, policymakers, they want to do something in the end that may or may not, right? IB scholars, we should advocate, right? It's for open, transparent, and uh, that kind of policy. Okay, thank you. Just one little bit of comment, right, Bob? Rules-based. Okay. Uh, or there's actually, uh, yeah, there's an, actually an interesting question in the chat room, which um, ties into uh, what Professor Chang Xiu has just said, and also the comments Andy previously made. So basically the question is, and uh, uh, whether and it's possible uh, to establish common rules, uh, given that uh, the national interests may not be uh, the same or not be well aligned, and whether it's possible to have common rules and then how to make common rules. I guess, you know, this is basically the question. Yeah, uh, can I have maybe, or, uh, Andy, uh, you know, you, you may want to go first. Yeah, I, I think building on some things that were said before, I, I think in terms of international rules, I think the idea of building on the international norms of conduct that have been discussed for years, uh, together with the, the recent initiative from, the, the, from China, the Global Initiative on Data Security, trying to come up with some specific rules and get governments and companies, because previously it's just been governments, to sign on to mutual trust agreements that they agree to do X, Y, and Z. Secondly, rules related to privacy. So you look at the discussion about TikTok and WeChat in the United States, and folks talk about, okay, we don't have a national privacy uh, policy in, in the U.S. Uh, look at GDPR, what the Europeans have. Issues about apps, about 5G, about mobile phones, about communication sector generally. Rules about, let's talk about personal data, personal privacy. Let's have rules and strict requirements uh, you can have technologies with third parties that can monitor the traffic so that you can pretty much guarantee and have auditable mechanisms, auditable rules to make sure people follow the rules, governments and private sector, and the global community needs to, to, to move in that direction much more strongly. In terms of standards of like supply chain, I hope some of you may know the Telecommunications Industry Association in America is working on a standard on supply chain security. I'm reaching out to a privacy group to encourage them, because you know, folks won't listen to me, encourage them to weigh in for how the standards can be developed to include privacy requirements. So you have standards with third party testing, third party conformance. It's not a perfect answer, but I think it could be a step in the right direction. Uh, uh, standards, Jeff, you want standards are the hidden plumbing of globalization. You can't have globalization without common standards. I mean, this, I know it's a very broad statement, but uh, whether we're talking about, you know, small technical standards, you know, there, there are standards even for leather gloves, there are standards for sh work shoes. I mean, if you made a list of all the products covered by ISO or international standards, you'd have thousands of pages. And that forms the basis for international commerce, otherwise you can't have it. Uh, here's a question which is actually related to and the thing and probably and uh, addressed briefly, uh, uh, briefly previously. So the question is, and uh, uh, you know, I think it's for all the panel members. Uh, so um, how do you assess the role of the EU uh, in the US-China relationship? How do you assess the role of EU, European Union, and in the tension between uh, China and the U.S.? Any anyone want to and uh, give a bit comment? Actually, uh, I have my education in a university close to Brussels. It's a okay. Catholic University of Leuven, or Leuven, depending which language, and uh, we uh, talk about that. I think that. Uh, of course, I think European Union is also uh, advanced countries. I think it's recently in, in economically, economic actually, China many standards, a technical standard, if, and follows a legal standard, legal system, actually follow the continental uh, legal system, right? Instead of the common law system that prevailing in in the U.S. I think that's uh, uh, from. Uh, technological point of view from international business point of view, actually there's, that's why when I teach in the IB classes, because for instance, Germany and other places, at the, even in the UK, France, 
for instance, state-owned enterprises. And that was nothing new to Europeans. In 60s, 70s, state-owned enterprises reformed. But in China, so that's why the system gap between European Union and China is closer. Then it's called institutional uh, distance. Uh, because US is at a, a, a very, I mean, more free market state rules, its business much more influenced than the, the so in that way, I think for business levels and uh, the distance between European uh, companies, that's why at the beginning, at early times, the Volkswagen came to China earlier and dominated the market because this is the thing. But in the future, uh, we do not know. You know, of course, uh, using my own case, why I end up in Brussels? Because 40 years ago, US and China engage a uh, fight, different reasons. So US, China, the academic exchanges stopped. So that's one reason I ended up in, in Brussels. I, of course, I enjoyed it very much, but I think this European uh, play a critical role in this regard, right? European Union in general, right? That, uh, uh, of course, I hopefully that uh, all the three major blocks would go together. I mean, that, that would be ideal. That's my that's my general comment. Okay, yeah. Uh, well, there, uh, there there are actually some some comments rather than questions uh, in the chat room, and I guess all the participants can take a look. Uh, so I think you know we are uh, already uh, you know over by quite a few minutes. Uh, I guess uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, you know uh, I, I would say uh, maybe any uh, additional final comments from the panel members, and please do so. Yeah, uh, Martin. Uh, I'll make one comment, which is there's a lot of focus on China and the U.S. There are many other countries. Uh, <laughs> and when we're looking at this, we shouldn't over-focus on that. We just talked about EU, for example. Um, at the moment, there is a growing perception in many, but not all countries, that the US and China are actually rather similar in some ways, in that they're both large economies, both want to be preeminent in some ways. That's the perception of many smaller countries. I think that both countries need to look at that uh, rather than just look at uh, the... the the sort of bilateral relations. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Eric? I want to make a final comment. Actually, it's not a comment. I want to leave a question for not only the panel, but also for the audience. It used to be that China was at one time a developing country. Now I would say it's no longer developing. It's a middle income country. So using the Volkswagen example raised by Professor Wu, there was a time when uh, maybe people said because China is a developing country, it's uh, legitimate to have very high tariffs preventing the import of automobiles. But then uh, there was another rule when Volkswagen or General Motors came to China to do tariff jumping FDI, they were forced to accept a local partner. Uh, so my point, my question I want to leave people with is the following. As China becomes richer and richer from a middle income to a rich advanced country, will it be fair for China to continue to have these protectionist uh, rules, internal rules, preventing multinational companies from coming in and owning freely 100% operations on their own instead of being subject to a punitive tariffs and forcing joint venture partners. What would be appropriate for China as an advanced society? I just want to throw that up. <laughs> yeah. Let me let me uh, make my closing comment. I'll, I'll, I'll comment on that. I, I think it's quite likely that the Biden administration will have much less of a, a use of tariffs the way that the Trump administration did. Uh, I certainly hope uh, that as part of multilateral negotiations that uh, China will have uh, fair rules on uh, access and, uh, and, and free trade. Regarding the European Union, and I, I want to echo some of the comments that were made, and there was a letter written, it was either today or yesterday, uh, of course I'm a different day than those of you in Beijing, but 
Uh, Charles Mitchell, the president of the European Council, wrote a letter to the leaders of the 27 member states of the European Union about trying to have a new multilateral initiative. Uh, clearly, the uh, European Union sees themselves not as secondary to the United States or China, but as an important market and important people in, the, in and of themselves, and they expect to be treated uh, with respect both as a customer uh, and as a supplier. And uh, they are working hard, the European Commission, on standards, for example, in the communications area uh, that, that hopefully can be, be a model for the rest of the world, just as the European Privacy Directive, GDPR, has had an influence. I'm, I'm told that the China government has a privacy law that has a lot of characteristics similar to uh, the GDPR that's, that, that's in the works. Uh, you know, something like that would be very helpful. And, of course, the United States needs something like that as well. In fact, it's called, it's called the Brussels effect. When the Brussels adopts a certain standard, it is often imitated and adopted by other countries and becomes a global or near global standard as GDPR has become. Okay. Uh, Professor Chan Chi Wu. Okay, the short answer, actually, just like let's wish we'll continue China for the open Actually, by the way, the information when I studied joint venture, in 20 years before China joined WTO, uh, there's 80% of foreign direct investment in China subsidiary in former joint ventures. But today, uh, there 80% are wholly owned subsidiaries. So very rare are joint ventures. That is, I think, even further. But the most of the joint venture are service sector, finance, other things. But this year and last year, all those sectors are further open, but manufacturing sector, almost no requirement for joint ventures. But for services, the banking and the securities, security, I mean, uh, financial services, before they used to have a, a insurance, but now it's uh, all open for foreign wholly owned subsidiaries. But still, the long way good. One indicator is so that uh, doing business in China index right, and developed by World Bank, and China has now, last year there were 37 uh, in the rank. But of course, they're not, not, uh, not like Singapore, not like uh, uh, Hong Kong, but still mainland China is uh, improving. So that hopefully that will improve for the better, right? Okay. Okay. Uh, all right, I guess, uh, uh, well, uh, sorry. And I know I probably missed one or two uh, questions, answers, uh, uh, questions or, or comments in the chat room, uh, but we are running out of time. Yeah, well, thank you very much, and uh, uh, Professor Contractor and all the panel members, and thank you very much and uh, for all of you to attend this public uh, lecture. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.